The first season of the anime adaptation for Promised Neverland was a success overall, with a lot of people praising this anime show for being one of the best thriller slash psychological stories that ever came out. As a result, with the arrival of the second season, everyone was very excited about the continuation of the series, especially with that amazing ending that we witnessed in the end of the first season. But that wasn't the case, and today's video I'm going to deep dive into the second season of Promised Neverland and kind of dissect what happened that made many many fans of the series so upset about the second season's adaptation. As a friendly reminder, this video contains spoilers to the entire story of Promised Neverland, including the manga adaptation, as I'll be covering both materials and kind of compare it for the sake of the argument. Bear in mind, this is not a review of the second season, but more an explanation for the outrage of many people in regard to the continuation of the anime adaptation. Also, before continuing, I would like to kindly ask if you could consider subscribing to my channel, like it and share it with other fellow anime fans, as I upload on a weekly basis everything related to anime, including discussions such as this one, honest reviews, top lists, anime news and much more. So, with that out of the way, let's jump right into it. In order to fully understand what went wrong, we need to head back to where, well, everything started to go downhill. And that was episode 3 of the second season. Yes, the episode where people started to question the faithfulness of this adaptation. For those of you who are curious to know the reasons behind the outrage from many fans, but are too lazy to read the manga, well... Like many other anime shows, when they are adapted, there's always some changes that are made, whether it be small chapters that are skipped or characters that are slightly tweaked. But for some reason, <laughs> someone at Cloverworks Studios thought it was a good idea to change the entire plot, make a lot of characters disappear out of thin air and rush almost 90 chapters in a time lapse of 30 seconds, which were the last 30 seconds of the second season. But some of you may be questioning, why episode 3? Well, for that we need to take a look at chapter 53 of the manga, where Emma and her family arrived at the bunker that Minerva had prepared for future fugitives of the different children farms. In the anime, we know that they get there and search the bunker from top to bottom. At some point, they also find this phone that is connected to the network between other farms where they can obtain valuable information. Some of the kids also find a strange room with cravings on the wall from people that used to live there asking for help and whatnot. And let me tell you, I could imagine manga readers almost tearing their own hair apart from that episode onwards. Well, in the manga, the first thing they meet in the underground refuge is a mysterious adult whose identity is unknown. And that individual is non-existent in the anime. So right off the hook, people realize that the anime either skipped a big portion of the story or that the plot was completely changed. Unfortunately, it was a combination of both, <laughs> because the anime has a total different plot, and yet some things were included, but briefly mentioned, like the seven walls, and the conciliation of demons and humans thanks to the evil blood. So what was the portion of the plot that was entirely skipped, you may ask? Well, in the manga, after meeting this mysterious individual, Emma and Ray convince this totally not friendly guy to guide them in order to find a certain location called 108-63, where they believe Minerva is located. And instead, this individual tricks them by sending them to a nest full of demons, where Emma is taken away. She's sent to this small demon playground, where nobles from the demon world hunt kids to satisfy their innermost pleasures. There she meets not only a full cast of interesting characters that had been surviving this hunt, but also a bunch of badass demons with interesting backgrounds. The next 30 chapters is pretty much about this fight for survival, where these kids plan to kill these demons. And let me tell you, some of the best action you could ever expect from this story occur during these moments. I was really excited for this season, especially for those moments to be animated. 
and the anime, well, they didn't show any of that. Instead, they changed the plot completely, as I mentioned, while skipping an entire arc where we understand that Norman was actually alive and how he used his smartness to get out of the predicament of being used as a test subject. Instead, we're told within two or three minutes about what had happened to him once he meets with Emma and Ray in the marketplace in that small town. Not to mention these two or three minutes were mentioned to the viewer without any illustrations whatsoever which I personally hate when I don't have anything shown to me as a form of image about a certain character's past. But anyways, but this isn't even the biggest issue for me. The worst thing from the second season is how much the anime was rushed overall. The first season covers the first 50 chapters or so of the manga and it was, well, amazingly executed. And in contrast, we get this amazingly rushed and underwhelming second season. There's a lot more about the lore and the way the promise between demons and humans was originally made, about how Minerva was so fed up with the way kids were raised as livestock only to be devoured by demons, and how he created this ultimate plan to put an end to the farms. And all of that was changed and superficially mentioned in the anime. Norman becomes a prick in the first few moments after he was reintroduced for tricking his best friends later on and also for wanting to kill all demons, only to realize how wrong he was when attacking a demon village. Oh, oh, and remember how mysterious Sonju and Mujika were in the anime? Remember how much Sonju seemed to plot against the kids because he ultimately wanted to eat them in a freely way? Yeah, fuck that, let's throw all of that out of the window and pretend it never happened. <sighs> to be honest, there are so many things about the lore that were simply skipped and yet introduced at the same time. For example, the Queen of Demons and all the nobles, they got one or two scenes in the entirety of the second season and we didn't even hear a single word out of the Queen herself. And don't get me started on the evil blood. <sighs> what the hell were they thinking in mentioning the evil blood without even explaining it? What was the point, honestly? The amount of places that were mentioned in the anime that were left behind just for the sake of rushing things? No worries, you got a glimpse of it in the last minute or so of the anime. I mean, talk about ruining an entire anime franchise, am I right? What about the creation of a new promise and their quest to find the seven walls? Nope. Fuck that, let's just skip that to the very end where they finally go to the human world that they don't even know what it looks like nor if they will ever be accepted or not. Oh, oh, and it was amazing to see in the anime how the caretakers of the farms all of a sudden turn against the demons and Peter Rattray without a full explanation. Of course, in the manga, we saw Isabella in the end going off against the demon while trying to protect the kids, which was, for me, more logical since she had been with those kids during their childhood, so she felt that strong connection as a mother and tried to protect them. But the other caretakers, we have never heard of them. There's no proper connection between Isabella's story with these children and the rest of them so why make everyone on the same side? The way the story ended in the anime was so underwhelming and to be honest it served merely as a rush factor to this whole mess. They wanted to finish this amazing story as quickly as possible and once all the children reached the door for the other world they believe it was a good idea to make Emma and the rest of the older cast stay behind and quote unquote save the world just to make an excuse to introduce some glimpses of the lore without even explaining it. Unlike the anime, the manga carefully went through all these places, making a proper story progression so it would make sense for the viewer, leading to a more touching ending with Emma losing her memories and reuniting with the rest of her family in the very end. It was more emotional and as a reader you feel that connection with the characters and empathize with them for all their struggles and how much they had to endure to reach a proper happy ending. And I did not feel any of that with the second season of this anime adaptation. All in all, all, I believe that this story went to the slaughterhouse of anime adaptations and be massacred as it had the great potential to be one of the best anime adaptations ever. As previously mentioned, the first season was amazing and the animation was fantastic. The overall quality and consistency was nonetheless spared in the second season, but the story was in my opinion ruined, hence the outrage from many fans of this series. If you are an anime only viewer, please consider reading the manga as the story is richer in every single aspect with a lot more character exploration and especially further lore explanation that the second season was lacking so much. Well, 
And that'll be it for this week's video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And as per usual, don't forget to watch your daily dose of anime because it's good for your brain and heart. Take care and I'll see all my beloved weeps in the next video.